Good. Welcome, everybody, um, and thank you for the opportunity to uh, to join you today. And welcome to World Rabies Day. Well, actually, we've missed it because World Rabies Day was yesterday, and I think the fact that we're not worried about rabies today must mean that it was a successful day. Uh, has anybody been worried about rabies since yesterday? Well, today is not actually World Rivers Day either. That was on Sunday. What day is it today? It's actually World Drink Beer Day. So maybe we'll do that at, at five o'clock this afternoon, but um, I think that's a very worthwhile world day. But what we're going to talk about today is, let me just start my timer here, is World Rivers Day. Now, World Rivers Day is a uh, an exciting opportunity for about 70 Oh, millions of people across 70 countries to celebrate their rivers and to, uh, most of the time people will do this by you know doing things along their own rivers thinking about their own rivers but the idea is for us to think about rivers globally as well so I thought that I would I start off by thinking today about the question of what why should the world care about Australian rivers and I'm talking to you today from Melbourne, where I'm on Wurundjeri country, and I just would like to um, share with others today in uh, acknowledging the traditional owners whose land has not been ceded, and whose many of us are on different country uh, across Australia, and so acknowledge their leaders past, present and emerging. So let me talk about why the world you care about Australian rivers. Now, in some ways, this is not a very good question, because everybody's focusing on their own rivers today. Um, and it can lead to all sorts of trite um, observations. But I, I think that we can learn something about this. And so let me make the, um, the following points about this incredible network of rivers that we see across our, our continent. So I'll make these four points. The first one is our rivers are amazing and different. Now, is that important? Does that mean that the rest of the world should care about them? Well, let's talk about that. Second, rivers are relevant to some international obligations. And so they're, they're, some of our rivers do have, if you like, international standing. So we'll look, look at those. The rest of the world might learn something from our management, both positive and negative, things not to do and things to do. And finally, the world is actually involved in the degradation uh, and the challenges to Australian rivers, as are all of us, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that. Now, I was going to talk about a couple of other things, um, but the first thing is that all of these points apply to us as well as to to people elsewhere. We can reflect on all of these, these four points as well. And finally, uh, I could was going to talk about the fantastic research that's being done in Australia. I think that's a major contribution to the world of rivers and we've seen some tremendous examples of it today but i really don't have enough time so i'll just touch on that in passing so let's have a look at these four points so the first one reason one why should we care the rest of the world care about our rivers well because they're amazing and different well in what way are they i mean physics is physics uh, biology is biology to some extent why uh, this idea that australian rivers are um, unusual or, or special. Well, there are reasons for this, and there are, I want to talk, touch on the drivers that really control that, and we've touched on this today, and the point I'm going to get to here is that the really distinctive rivers of Australia are the dry land rivers. Now, there's not, I'm not saying that the other rivers aren't important, but these are the ones that stand out as internationally distinctive. And the, there are reasons for this, and the first one is that Australia is low, flat, old and leached. So um, it is um, lower than, than any other continent. It's flatter than any other continent. It's um, a couple of billion years it's been sitting there leaching away the nutrients, which means that a lot of our rivers um, experience very low nutrient status. It's tectonically stable, which relates to the first point. We don't, we have unimpressive mountains. We don't have much uplift. We've got low denudation rates, low sediment yields relatively. We've got the lowest runoff and the highest interannual flow variability. Now, these are all related, actually. The, the, the low 
runoff, the low, um, the high variability are also related to the uh, unimpressive mountains because we don't have orographic uh, mountains to, to drive the, uh, the climate like we do in, say, South America and you think internationally. So th that's related. Um, and we, we all, when I talk about the interannual flow variability, it's not just that Australia is dry, but the bits of Australia that are dry are more variable than elsewhere. And so, you know, often people talk about how Antarctica is the driest continent. Well, it's got the lowest rainfall, but it, about 90% of the rainfall in Antarctica runs off, whereas in Australia, the average runoff is about 10%. The Murray-Darling Basin is about 6%. So the conversion to runoff is what matters, and that's really low in Australia. We also lack glaciation, which means that there's the, the rivers of the continent have really been sitting there unchanged. Where if you think about Northern Europe, most of North America was reset by glaciation through the last uh, glacial cycles. And that the, the whole um, fluvial system reset and is really recovering from the, the last glacial 18,000 years ago. So that sort of didn't happen. The last couple of million years, even, we haven't had intense glaciation. So what we're looking at is almost end member river styles across the continent. We have interaction with aeolian systems. And the other interesting thing is the interaction with riparian trees. Unlike a lot of uh, places in the arid and semi-arid zones of the planet, our riparian trees are everywhere. Everywhere there's a river or there's water, there are riparian trees, the cooler bars, the red gums, the tea trees and they interact intimately with the character of our rivers. There's also extreme sensitivity to hydrological change, and uh, that was, has been discussed by Zach today, the uh, remarkable variation. I, I don't want, want you to think that the rivers haven't changed. They're un ch unchanging in Australia, they're not. They've changed spectacularly over the last tens of thousands of years, and that's because they're extremely sensitive to, to disturbance, particularly hydrological. Um, the result of all of this is that our dryland rivers are pretty special. And Fran talked about this this morning. And if we look at this typical uh, scene here, we've got anabranching. They're not braided. They're often called braided rivers. There are no true braided rivers in Australia. They're vegetated. They're interacting with the dunes and the, the Aeolian areas. We've got special character of wetlands and floodplains. And they're also sensitive, as Zach mentioned this morning. If on the ground, they tend to look like this, where we'll have, um, uh, they're, they're dry. 80% of Australian streams are dry at any one time. So they're the, the, most, the driest stream networks, really, on the planet. And that means that they're often invaded by vegetation, and the vegetation interacts with the, the, the streams. And these are the trees in um, uh, Marilana Creek up in the Pilbara that we've been looking at. Everywhere you'll see uh, aerial images of the weird Australian dryland streams. And here we can see the, a stream in Western Australia interacting with saline groundwater systems. Uh, we can see the boom and bust hydrology that Fran mentioned this morning. This is the Sturt Creek on the Tanami, edge of the Tanami Desert. Um, we can see the stream, the, the trees and the, the linear uh, anabranching systems. In, inside the, the rivers. And the extreme example of everything I'm talking about here are really the fossil drainage networks of southwestern Western Australia. These are in the Yilgarn Craton, it's called, down in the wheat belt, essentially. And these are remarkable systems that have really been arid for at least 20 million years. And so they've been dry, they're salt lake systems. This is what they look like on the ground. And in a lot of ways, these are some of the most remarkable streams in Australia, but also completely um, unknown uh, how, how important they are. And I'm not saying that international people should you know, necessarily care about the, the management of these systems, but I'm certainly saying that it's useful to understand the distinctive character of Australian streams. And then, of course, we've got the spectacular... Um, streams of so this one's um, in the uh, northern Australia, streams draining off the great um, shield, the, uh, the ancient landscapes which have been uh, sitting there for, for billions of years. Now, 
Another factor in this is that we haven't actually wrecked all of these rivers yet. If you look at the population density of the planet, Australia is down there in the bottom right. And you can see that actually the population density of a lot of Australia is about the same as the ocean. So that means that even though we've done our best as Europeans in the last 200 years or so to, to degrade these streams, we still have amongst the largest systems in these dry land systems of uh, streams in quite good condition for their entire catchment. We're the most intact large river systems on earth. Uh, and it's uh, comparable to parts of um, the Amazon, uh, North Africa, and uh, sort of Western Africa. So th these are very distinctive streams in that regard. The other important as aspect here is the long relationship between humans and rivers. And this is just a random example where this is the Werribee River, which is uh, where Melinda Kennedy was mentioning this morning. It's not far from Melbourne. This is a, um, a trench or where, where this, the regional rail link goes here. A trench was dug where that pylon was. Uh, and there were 1,387 artefacts found in a one metre deep pit um, at that site. And that's just 6,000 years of, of occupation. So the interaction between humans over tens of thousands of years and river systems is, um, uh, is characteristic uh, and, and very important. And other people know a lot more about that than me and are going to talk about it uh, later on. But what about the Murray-Darling Basin? This is the, the, the catchment that gets the most um, news and I suppose is best known in the world. It's, it's seen to be Australia's um, dominant catchment. Well, I'm not saying it's not important. Of course not, but it's also extremely challenged basin. You know, if you look at this is the um, relative water, surface water percentage that's been uh, diverted. And we can see across Australia that the, the Murray-Darling 69% of divertible yield is now diverted. And that's a, uh, a minimum number, whereas the rest of the continent, it's much, much less. And so there are much greater opportunities uh, my point here is not that the Murray-Darling Basin is not important, it's that we have to think about the rest of the continent as well uh, and the significance of those uh, streams and catchments. The other thing about, this is an example of the Macquarie River, and this is uh, information from uh, Richard Kingsford. I mean, the amount of development that's gone on in these uh, the, the plains of the east and the Murray-Darling is just phenomenal. Where we've here, we've got examples of tanks, levees, channels. Really difficult to manage and restore these systems. Uh, a lot of other systems, uh, the dryland systems we're talking about, are much less degraded, and there are real opportunities to look at those. What about the other wet rivers, if you like, the southern Tasmania, um, the east coast, the uh, the wet tropics? Again, I'm not saying that they're, they're not important. They're probably, I mean, if you looked at this picture, you, uh, in, a, in a lot of ways, you could be in Canada, you could be in North America. These humid systems, uh, are, they have their own characteristics, but um, they're perhaps not as internationally distinctive. And interestingly, those systems, which are the humid coastal systems and the Tasmania systems are actually better protected than the arid zone systems in Australia, the dry land systems. And this is some really nice work done by Janet Stein in 2011, where we've only got 1.4% or 3,500 kilometres of the length of Australia's 1,500 or so named rivers have fully protected upper catchments and no major dams impeding movement of biota. So this is looking at this big question about reserve design across the, the country. And ironically, more rivers are protected in the more humid and settled areas in their entirety than in the arid zone. That's partly because the catchments are smaller on the coast, but these dry land systems are both little known and unprotected in a lot of ways. So um, that's a real opportunity and, and it also gives Australia rivers international distinctiveness. So this is a quote from that Stein and Neville paper, Australia lacks national river protection, protection mechanisms in spite of calls for action over several decades. And I think this is quite um, ironic that for an international visitor 
they can learn a lot more about the world's best practice in reserve design science in Australia, but would not be able to see such a reserve system established here. Australia is a global leader in the design and thinking about reserve system uh, science, uh, particularly out of University of Queensland, um, Griffith University and other places, but the application of that is still modest across Australia. So what am I saying? I'm saying these are important internationally, these dry land rivers. They're not well recognised, they're not well understood. We've had some fantastic talks today that show that we're um, uh, fixing that problem in terms of science. We've still got a long way to go in terms of protection. Now, an example of this is, um, imagine um, I was flying up to, to Asia. Um, I'm in a, a dream line in one of these new planes and the, the plane is, it's midday and the plane is dark except there's one window open in the plane and that was my window. And I'm looking out at the beautiful rivers of Australia at the window and the, um, the flight attendant came and asked, can you please shut your window because it's disturbing people who want to watch movies. And I said, no, I want to look at the rivers of Australia as they go beneath me. That's, that's my human rights issue. And so she went up the end and actually turned my window dark. You know those, they're, they're electronic windows. Oh, it was, so I went down the back and was trying to look out the window of the door, looking at these beautiful things. And they thought that I was trying to open the door to get out. And it was actually a bit of an international incident as they, uh, they actually sort of wrestled me away from the door. The, because what's my point here? It's that I suspect that most people on that plane don't care about the rivers of Australia. They wanted to watch, I don't know, the, the Lion King or something on on the TV. So uh, I think we've got quite a long way to go in just in, uh, educating people about Australian rivers. And of course, international people love these guys, but uh, platypus and Murray Cod and uh, the, the crocodiles. But uh, internationally, yeah, they're really important, but there's other things to think about as well. So reason two now, let me move on. So what, why are we fulfilling our international obligations? International people care about our rivers because they have international standing. And these are the world heritage areas around Australia, and several of these are defined in relation to their rivers. Uh, certainly the, the world heritage sites in Tasmania. Um, all of these ones are have river characteristics as central to um, to them, either as uh, important or as threatening processes. And the most recent one, Lake Conda, which is down here in the south, in um, in Victoria, is uh, an indigenous world heritage area, and it's entirely intimately related to the character of the the waterways in that area. And our global responsibilities here are well defined in protecting the, the, the rivers in these systems. Uh, and there's also very clear impacts of rivers on these World Heritage Values. And Steve Lewis this morning gave us an, an amazing talk, I think, about the how the rivers and of the catchment affect the, the Great Barrier Reef and our international responsibility. So 40% of the excess erosion is coming from gullies from just 0.1% of the Great Barrier Reef. And so individuals there and um, landholders are affecting this global asset and in a lot of ways Australia is paying compensation to these landholders to protect this global asset and that's of international interest. Ramsar sites is another example of inter international responsibilities that we've got and these are, um, this is from Richard Kingsford, it shows all the Ramsar sites around the Murray-Darling Basin how are we going with those? There's been a lot of discussion about how we're not fulfilling our responsibilities for Ramsar sites. In Victoria, there was a parliamentary inquiry um, into this and the, um, the Auditor General concluded, overall, the governance coordination and oversight of the management of Ramsar sites must improve for Victoria to effectively meet its obligations under the Convention. And that's 11 of the 64 sites in Australia. So that's a second reason why international people might care about Australian rivers. They have international standing and we have international responsibilities for those. The third reason, I think, is that others might be able to learn from our experience in Australia as managers. Um, and there's some pretty basic things to learn. Don't over allocate your water because otherwise you'll spend the rest of your life trying to claw it back. Don't clear everything. 
Um, now, I don't know that these lessons are really, it's too late in most of the world, but, but we've done a pretty good job nationally, a tiny population in Australia of influencing the character of rivers across our continent. Don't disenfranchise the traditional owners. And we're now trying to claw that back as well, slowly. But the Murray-Darling Basin has been an example of a, a place that's always been an iconic in the way it was managed. If you go to the Mekong Basin, if you go to a lot of basins around the planet, they'll always talk about the Murray-Darling as um, an example of, of integrated catchment management. More recently, we've had the COAG reforms, which I do think are of international significance. They started in 1994, again, almost out of desperation because we'd run out of water. The goal was to address rampant overallocation of public water to irrigators and to others, splitting rights to water from rights to land, introducing a water market. And not all of you will agree with this quote, but this is um, a by Seidel. Southern connected Murray-Darling Basin water market is recognised as the most advanced water market globally. It's certainly the most advanced. It's a lot of debate about its um, consequences, but it's um, effective. And another consequence of that is the environmental water allocation. The voluntary buyback, again, controversial, but it's also unique in the world. No other country has that, that um, process of buying back water. And the Commonwealth of Australia is now the, the largest environmental water holder in Australia, holding two cubic kilometres of long-term average annual yield. Um, now, this has influence around the world. It's a bit hard to find out where, but certainly one place that's been dramatically affected by Australian water policy is China. Um, and it's, um, our policy has spurred the remarkable development of water markets in China in the last decade. They've, um, they've looked at Australian models, they've liked them, and they're now rolling them out across a chi China and pot potentially will be the, the, the biggest um, influence of our policy. Another is in China, the... Our environmental water policy is certainly influencing the explosion of ecological water in China, which is the largest growing water type in that country. So we're certainly having influence in other places. Lots of other things we could think about in terms of influential Australian programs. You can think of more our biomonitoring system, say the Australian Rivers Assessment System, Oz Rivers, was a world first, the National River Health Program, uh, stacks of state programs we can learn from but are not well known often, and we don't seem to accumulate the, those lessons very well. The EPBC Act, which is um, under some threat at the moment, is another, I think, internationally significant piece of legislation. And I'm sure you can think of, of lots more. And I also mentioned again the incredibly influential river research that we do. The, um, we've heard a lot about that today, the Australian Rivers Institute, uh, reef research, river styles, all of this research that many of the people um, who have talked to us today are, are involved in. What about indigenous management of rivers? And Bradley's going to talk about this this afternoon. And again, I say there are people much better equipped to talk about this. But my observation is we are starting to make um, some inroads into this. Um, certainly in Victoria, there's um, a, a, a real... Um, mood that indigenous interests in, in water are, are being reflected uh, in, in a better ways. So we're getting better around the continent. There are all sorts of opportunities here, but still all sorts of problems, particularly around indigenous water allocations. And this is a paper I mentioned here that just come out from Hartwig and Co. looking at indigenous water allocations and suggesting that the Aboriginal people in, in this part of New South Wales constitute nearly 10% of the total population, but their organisations hold only 0.2% of the available surface water. And more disturbingly, the volume held by Aboriginal people has fallen by one-fifth, 17%, since 2009, which we certainly wouldn't expect. So a long way to go there. I'm sure around the planet we can think of New Zealand, of Canada, um, Finland, Scandinavia, where Indigenous people have much more influence already over uh, rivers and water resources, but that's coming in Australia. 23% of the land in Australia is now controlled by Indigenous communities. So in this figure, you can see a lot of Central Australia, all of those light purple mauve coloured areas are actually controlled by Indigenous communities. Whether they actually have influence over river management is, is a, um, again, open 
to debate, but the opportunity is growing there. That's one of the biggest changes in a lot of ways in Australian management is the area of land that's controlled by Indigenous groups. And most people aren't aware of just how substantial that is. And again, it uh, needs to translate into um, management and responsibility. Now, the fourth and last thing I'd like to talk about is the uh, of why the world should care about our rivers in Australia is because actually the world and all of us are involved in degrading them. In this globalised world, um, we can't think about it as a separate group of people. We're all in this together. And so here's a simple example. Here's some cows. This is in um, a stream up in the, up at Murray catchment. You can see it was burnt recently. Uh, it's really under stress, that system, and the cows are in trashing those waterways. And anybody who knows me knows that I am not a fan of cows in rivers. And um, maybe this is um, one of my life's works, but I want to get them out of the rivers. And let's think about that in terms of international issues. So food and fibre production essentially degrades rivers. If we didn't, we weren't producing food and fibre and leaving aside urbanisation, then our rivers wouldn't be degraded. So most degradation of waterways outside of cities is due to food and fibre production. Everybody who eats food, and I assume that's most people on this um, talk, on this call today, all wears cotton, is involved in the degradation of our rivers, whether we like it or not. And we only import, this is remarkable, only 6.6% of food in Australia is imported. So we produce you know, over 90% of our own food. So we are all deeply involved in the impact on rivers. And, but we feed a further 36.6 million people worldwide via food exports. And where do those exports go? You can see China, ASEAN nations, Japan, the EU, obviously the, um, the whole world, the United States. So all of those people are involved in the impacts of agriculture on uh, waterways and stream systems. So every time you uh, enjoy a Coca-Cola and Coke, these two litre bottles of Coke, did you know this, is the most commonly purchased item in Australian supermarkets, which is a shocking uh, fact. Um, I think that and Panadol. But so there it is. We've got those. Every time you drink one of those two litre Coke bottles, you're drinking um, sugar from uh, the sugarcane areas. Now, 60% of the sugarcane industry is now foreign owned. Um, now, what, there's all sorts of impacts of that industry on, on waterways. Uh, who's responsible for that? What about foreign ownership in water and agriculture? So one in 10 water entitlements is foreign owned. So that's 10.4% of the, the, the water purchased, and that's Chinese and US investors. Each own about 2%, followed by the UK owning 1.1%. So the Murray-Darling Basin and all the water allocation is, is also wrapped up with international interests. In terms of land ownership, 13.6% of Australia is owned, 30% of the Northern Territory, 11% of Western Australia, and look down the bottom there, 22% of Tasmania is foreign owned. That's different from owning the food companies, but and I'm not arguing here that there's anything wrong with, with them owning it. All I'm saying is international interests are involved in the state of our waterways. 60% of those are from the UK and 16% from the US. Now, they are, um, are countries who have uh, deep interests in environmental um, policy and processes. Now, what are most of those uh, foreign ownership? What's it about? It's 90% beef grazing. So let me turn to cows. Australia is now the world's largest beef exporter, most valuable beef exporter. It's um, just past the US and Brazil, and it's Australia's largest uh, food export. Where is it going to? It's going to China, Japan, the US, Korea, and everywhere else, uh, right through Asia. Now, do these consumers care about where their beef comes from? Do they have any, should they care about it? That's the point we're, we're getting at here. And 
Farms engaged in beef cattle production, we know that a lot of them are foreign owned, manage more than 75% of Australia's agricultural land and you can see where, where it's all distributed. The, those arid zone dry land streams I'm talking about are affected by grazing. Now 77.5% of that is exported, those international consumers are involved and there's a growing push for responsible production. Now Fran this morning mentioned that the sustainable beef of the Northern Murray Basin. So I'm not saying that all beef production is bad by any means. In, sometimes, in fact, the beef producers are the best advocates for the protection of the waterways. And we've seen that right through Queensland and um, in all sorts of places. In a lot of ways, managing dairy is easier than beef um, because dairy cows are more placid. The industry is more um, coherent. Uh, beef cows are all over the place, very hard to manage. But what is the responsibility of all of these people for this issue? Well, I'm thinking here of Octeti, I'm thinking of BHP. So BHP used to go up to the Octeti mine in New Guinea and let's say we would manage these rivers in, um, according to the laws of the country in which we're in. Since the, the, um, the damage to that place, they now consider that um, they should be bringing higher standards and so these foreign companies aren't just, it's not just related to our law, it's related to something bigger than that. And the New Zealand Dairy Accord is a great example of this, where the dairy industry has been turned around by the Dirty Dairying Campaign, um, the, the NGO Fish and Game were responsible for doing this. It's a real salutary example of what can be produced by pressure through production of food. So let me conclude. So I wouldn't say that the world should care about Australian rivers, because should is a terrible word. It's more we would invite the world to consider Australian rivers. Why? Because our, because our rivers are distinctive, and the inland dry land rivers are particularly distinctive and underappreciated. Um, they're globally significant. We can also check how we're managing some designated world-class river systems, because these systems have international standing, and we're responsible for them. The third point, others can learn a bit from our management, both positive and negative, and I think we need to pull all that together, the lessons better. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, we are all involved in this. The globalised world means that the degradation of our waterways and, and their recovery is a global question. So we can't think about this um, we're not um, uninvolved. Every time you buy something in the supermarket, you're involved. And we should think about that. And we should think about the responsibilities of all of us. And each of these points applies equally to us. Our appreciation of waterways, our responsibility for world-class rivers, and also our responsibility through food production for the degradation of those waterways. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Oh, I should say, my last point I should say is, next time you're in a plane and you're, you're flying along and they refuse to open the windows, I think you need to protest without getting arrested because this is a major human rights issue now is looking out of the windows of a plane at beautiful Australian rivers. Thank you. Thanks, Ian.